Let us pray. Gracious and merciful Father, we bless your mighty name. We are not worthy of even reading your word or coming to the table. But in your Son, Jesus Christ, we have become. We have been transformed. We have become worthy because we are yours. Father, in all humility and honesty and with a humble approach, we come to you saying that we are yours. We submit everything that we have in our minds and hearts and worriness and thinking, everything to you, God, even our own will. We give it all to you. Would you please take it away from us? And help us to being active participants, listeners to your Holy Word and Holy Spirit. Therefore, I beg you to speak to me and through me, to all of us, through your Holy Word. In the name of Christ, your Son, we pray. Amen. Amen. So aside from political the differences that either you want to call it Columbus Day or indigenous, what is that called, Indigenous Peoples Day, Day. which is in some states that they call it, Today is the, just kind of an excuse that we can have Matthew among us because of the Columbus long, long weekend celebration. So uh, Matthew could be here. So glad that you are here, Matthew. I wish my son Matthew was here too. <laughs> but so glad. So it's a long weekend, right? No school. That's good. But it's, it's more than that. Columbus Day comes with a story attached to it, right? Whatever you call it, the title. You guys know the story better than I do, probably. But this is the simplest version. A man, an Italian man, a sailor, set off the shores, it's just the seas, to come across the Atlantic Ocean to find a faster route a, to, get, to get there to the Far East. Boy, he made it to America. He acted like an Iranian sailor, right? He wanted to get somewhere else, ended up somewhere else, which is, which is a huge surprise. Surprise! A big surprise, right? Now, can you think of a surprise in your life? A huge surprise. Yesterday, on my, my Facebook, um, I received a note from uh, one of our sisters in Christ, Susan, who lives in Seattle. She said that she has traveled to Washington, D.C. recently, and then from the airport, she grabbed an Uber. The Uber driver, surprise, 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 was an Iranian. Duh. But then that Iranian man happened to be a former Muslim Christian servant of the Lord. And she started sharing the stories. And, oh, I know an Iranian pastor in Seattle, Mansoor. And they said, oh, I know him. That is not a big surprise to me, by the way, because I used to preach at their church for three years. So when we were living in, in, in Princeton, but uh, kind of, she said, Susan said, well, that was a surprise, a big surprise. Well, in a way it can be. But that's a very small surprise. In many ways, there are surprises in life that are so huge. A jaw drops, it's wow, right? You've been in that situation many times. Let me read something that someone wrote. You will get to know him in a second. In fact, you know him. I'm going to read something that is a surprise. Okay? Now, listen carefully. A person whom I love and respect big time, he or she, he, says, I believe in no religion. I believe in no religion. There is absolutely no proof for any of them. And from a philosophical standpoint, Christianity is not even the best. All religions, that is, all mythologies to give them their proper name are merely man's 
own invention. I'm not going to surprise you. I have not become an atheist, by the way. So I'm just, keep, keep, let, me, let, me, let me read more. A few years later, the same person, the very same person, says this. Now you will get the name. Listen. I know very well when. Listen. I know very well when, but hardly know how the final step was taken. I was driven to zoo one sunny day. When we set out, I did not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And when we reached the zoo, I did. Yet, I had not exactly spent the journey in thought, nor in great emotion. It was more like a man after a long sleep, still lying motionless in bed, becomes aware that he is now awake. That person who wrote both of these quotations a few years apart is the great British author, theologian, apologist, radio broadcaster, C.S. Lewis. That's him. C.S. Lewis. A great surprise, right? Many of us know him for mere Christianity and all those good books that he has written. Once upon a time, from being a follower of a, an institution, he became an atheist. And from an atheism, he became a theist, and then he became a follower of Jesus Christ. To the point that now we have C.S. Lewis, a great man that created amazing writings. I mean, Narnia, it's, it's not just a series of books. It has become the foundation for many ministries in restricted nations like mine and in Pakistan and Saudi Arabia and Egypt and elsewhere. Many Christian missionaries are doing the great work of mission the way that C.S. Lewis wrote Narnia. Not copycatting, but thinking actively and creatively of a man who was atheist, who says just a few years earlier on the first line, I believe in no religion. Surprise, surprise, surprise. A huge surprise. And in fact, one of the greatest readings during the study of our Roman if you have not read yet, order it today and read it. Surprised by Joy. A good book, Surprised by Joy. C.S. Lewis, Surprised by Joy. A good book to read. And that is, that is highly recommended. Because then you will not only learn about a person who is surprised by joy, by the joy of restoration of his faith and transformation in Christ, but then you will learn to see things in your life. That will make you surprised. Oh, wow. No kidding. No kidding. Surprised by joy. Salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ is the hugest surprise in everyone's life. Nothing else. The salvation in my life? You just know a bit about my life. You barely know your own life. All the details, some good and fancy snapshots of the past. You, yeah, you remember those. Uh, dig through all of your personality and my personality and all the goofy things we have done in our life. Boy, surprise, surprise, surprise. The Mansur that you see today is not the same Mansur that was in existence before giving his heart to Christ. It's a huge surprise. But even bigger surprise than that is... Two things. Number one, the surprise that who we become, glorious bodies, a part of his body, the church, the new Jerusalem. But there, here on earth, that's in heaven, that's eschaton. Here on earth, while you and I are still followers of Jesus Christ, there is a possibility that you and I will fall into a bad surprise too. And the bad surprise is that as a follower of Christ, you will be ashamed of the gospel. I have seen many Christians. Well, it has to be defined, the definition of Christians in this case, that were ashamed of the gospel. They were not boldly 
sharing what that means to them to be saved in Christ. Paul, on verse 16, chapter 1 of his letter to Romans, which we'll hear in a few seconds, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Now, one of the things that I want to encourage our church, this small congregation, is to practice not to be ashamed of the gospel. Practicing that not just in areas of evangelism, which is fantastic, keep doing what you're doing or and beyond. Literally, word evangelism to take this gospel out there and giving that to someone needs courageous people. Are you ashamed of this? You are not. Then give it away. Talk to people. People are dying every day. Not just spiritually, but physically, they are losing their opportunity to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. That is bold. That's boldness of not being ashamed of the gospel. And believe it or not, surprise, 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 there are many who are going to church like you and I, but do not share the gospel. They are ashamed of the gospel. Because, you know, it's people's whatever, fill the blank. This past week I was with a brother from Norway. A man that I invited him in the near future to come and preach the word here. He was ordained in the Lutheran Church of Norway. But a solid evangelist. A man that is not ashamed of the gospel. Sven, if I'm, I'm pronouncing correctly, S-V-E-I-N. Sven is a bold Christian. And I was surprised to hear. I thought he is from Saudi Arabia or something. So hot for the gospel. But no, he said, no, I am a Norwegian. So he will be soon here. That is the power of the gospel that we should not be ashamed of. Now, that is one, one way. There are many other ways. I would like to encourage you to prayerfully come and take, partnership, take part in partnership in the worship leadership. We have this wonderful... Uh, Brother Dotius, that reads the scripture passage. It's fantastic. But that would be horrible if it becomes his and only his ministry. I would like to see Dotius in many other areas. How about if some of you help him in the reading of the scripture? How about if some of you help in the prayer of the people? You are prayer warriors. You will do much better than a person that needs to think and speak the prayer in English. Me. How about other parts of the liturgy? This requires boldness of people who are not ashamed of the gospel. With that, let's boldly stand up together, asking our brother Datios to come and read the Holy Scripture. Romans chapter 1, verses 8 through 17. At the end of this reading, brother Datios will say, this is the word of God. And that is your turn, my turn, and people on the Facebook, our turn. To say thanks be to God. This is how we confess, how we proclaim that we are not ashamed of the gospel. Listen carefully. We are reading God's holy word. Amen. 
Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Merci, brother Aziz. Thank you, that's your strength. So last Sunday when we started the study of the book of Romans, I said something that uh, I was corrected later on, I appreciate that. Uh, so they just kind of, in, uh, I'm not going to justify that, but I thought living will is the last will. And I was wrong. So if you listen carefully to the last week's sermon, there is a correction. What I meant by living will is not, was not, and is not the living will. It was the last will. So what the context was is connected to this sermon today. And that is why I mentioned that. Because Paul, that's how he feels. He feels that he wants to be with the people in Rome, but he's not going to make it. Even though he desires and he longs and he, he really wants to get there for years. But he has a sort of feeling, you know, how about if, if I don't make it? How about if I got killed beforehand? But yet he has that, that boldness, that responsibility, that he wants to deliver the message of the gospel to the West, to the people in Rome. So he says that I've been serving the East, in Macedonia and the Cypriot island and this part of the world for years, establishing churches, being persecuted for faith, facing all sorts of challenges in my life. Yet, I want to do the same thing in, the, in Rome, in the West. If I don't make it, how about if I don't make it? I want the message to go across. And that's when he writes, literally, he writes his last will. That is why this beautiful letter, the letter to Romans, is a very solid, theological, strong letter because he wants to say all that he wants to say without missing a major point, especially in the areas of the proclamation of the gospel. So that's, that's Paul. Paul writes his last and final will in the book of Romans. And the introduction to this will, similar to any, any, any will, there is an introduction, a preamble, that it starts with verse 1, and ends in verse 17. So last Sunday and this Sunday, together, these two passages are making up the introduction to the letter to the Romans. Today is the ending part of the Romans letter. Yes. I'm so glad that Stephen can edit and clear, delete this part. It would be weird for people not knowing what is happening here. Okay. Paul is writing his introduction to this theologically sound and foundational letter, the, the, the letter to the Romans. And this important letter that he writes um, has a lot of, I mean, seriously, if we study every word of that, there's a lot to learn and discuss. Yet, I want us to just get in just quicker to the theological points starting two Sundays from now. For now, let's finish the, 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 the introduction. In verse 8, can we, Stephen, can we have those verses one more time on the screen, please? On verse 8, he lays that serious, seriously important foundation. First things always first. How do you start your emails? I have seen many business emails in my life, both in America and in the West. I am intrigued by many Christians when they start their, 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 their email. It's sometimes even the beginning of their business emails are slightly different. There is always that proper greetings and so hey dude paul is not saying hey dude he says first i thank god through christ it is extremely important to put first things first in any business is the in the businesses in the communications in the writings in the relationship in the conversations that we have it is proper it's important for us to have that 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 first thing first mentality I don't want to create a, hip, a community of hypocrites, not at all. But let that be so genuine that comes out of you so naturally that you cannot not be presenting the gospel or being a Christian. This morning at the study of Leviticus chapter 11, we, one of the questions, the first question to ponder was that what are the similarities and differences that you can identify in you 
in relationship with others around you. I mean, there is a lot of, I mean, similarities that we have, but uh, there should be some differences, and not to those differences should not elevate us above other people, by all means, not at all. In fact, the contrary, the opposite is correct, is to just show that salt and light so that people will see the light of Christ and would give their hearts to Christ. Uh, there should be a difference. How do you start your communications? How do you start your business? How do you start? I don't want to, again, I don't want to create a community of hypocrites or a group of um, religiosity preoccupied people. Not at all. In fact, that would be fantastic if we let that soak in and that becomes a part of our personality to present God in our approaches. First things first. He says, I thank Christ. I thank God. But then builds the rest, anything else, on that foundation. Now, the following verses, there are four points. Number one, he encourages, he supports, he loves, and he affirms the other believers. He encourages, he supports, he loves, and he affirms others. It's important to get all these four points in order. Then you will see the conclusion in verses 16 and 17 where he seeks the affirmation and the support and the love and the encouragement of the community of faith. And that's verses 16 and 17. So basically what he is doing, he leads by example, but yet at the same time he doesn't put himself above the people. He lowers himself to the reality level, seeking the encouragement, the support, the love, and the affirmation of the community of faith. Verse 8 Second part. First, I thank God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. Last Sunday, we discussed and we thought of the fame of the believer that is not in them but in Christ. The fame of God endowed in them. And they are famous not for the, who they are, but famous for their following of the Lord. Famous for faithfulness and being ready to be humble. It is so humbling to be famous for Christ. It is not going to make you a celebrity, by the way. Being famous for Christ does not mean that you'll be made a famous person in the world, walking around and signing paper. Famous for Christ means requires a lot of humility. You all are famous in Christ, and I'm honored to be among you. It's a humbling experience. It's a reality that is not much celebrated by the world around us. Paul encourages the believers in Rome by speaking to them and telling them that this is who you are. You are famous because of your faithfulness. Now there are sufferings. But he doesn't end right here. He also goes on to support them in verse 9 and 10. For God is my witness. He's, he's just bringing that uh, oath to, just to assure that, hey, I'm telling you the truth. Whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing, I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow, by God's will, I may now at least, at last, succeed, succeed in coming to you. A good friend of mine in Philadelphia, Andy Hudson. He prays for me, still praying, ever since 2005. Do you know how I know he is praying? I am not a superstitious person, by the way. I am not. Sometimes I feel prayers. I'm not a superstitious. I just read texts when they are written in pure English or in pure Farsi, and I understand those. When he pray, he is praying for me. He sends a text message that this morning I'm praying for you, Brother Mansur. How wonderful it is. Do you, do you know how to send a text message? Not you all, some of you. Do you know how to send a text message? No? Go and learn it. <laughs> it's good when you pray for someone to let them know that you pray for them. How about an email? How about a phone call? How about in person? This past week I've been praying for you by name. And I want to encourage you for that. But it does, it's not a one-way road. Friends, I know that you are praying for me. Remind me. 
Tell me. It is not going to make you pride. It is making you more humble. That is not, you are not, in, you are not giving words of empowerment. You're not energizing me. You're encouraging me. You're supporting me. You're supplicating for and on my behalf. This is good. When you pray for someone, learn from Paul. Tell him. Tell him that you are praying for that person. It doesn't take that much of time. I know that some of you spend long minutes or sometimes hours praying for someone that you love or you care for. Let them know that you have been praying for them. I sometimes go bold and I just tell people, hey, the need that you just shared with me, I'm going to pray for you seriously. But you got to promise. When you hear God's voice, when you hear the answer, would you please share that in a form of testimony with someone? Don't keep it for yourself. Friends, be bold. God hears our prayers because we are not offering those in our name or power. We are offering our prayers in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ who I serve, who we serve for the sake of the gospel. And God honors those prayers. Be a bold person like Paul. So when you pray, next time when you pray for someone, would you please let them know? No text message, that's fine. Use other means of communication. Let them, let them know that they are being supported. Let them know that they are not alone in their, their, their struggle, their, their journey that they are going In your bulletins, page 3, there is a scripture, scripture passage from Romans chapter 15, verses 33, 33. Paul says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Holy Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may, may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May, may the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Paul is not just encouraging others by telling them that I pray for you, but also he's begging, hey, pray for me. Now, if you don't send a text message when you pray for someone, send them a text message when you need a prayer or an email or something. Tell them. Share with them. Share with them the needs, the struggle. Communicate. If you don't say it, they don't know it. But when they hear it, you all of a sudden you will realize, that, wow, I am not alone in this fight. Paul encourages and supports the believers. You know why? Because he loves them. So verse 8, B is encouragement. Verse nine, verses 9 and 10 are support. Support of other believers. Verses 11 and 12. Can we see verses 11 and 12? There you go. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is that... We may, we, may be mutually, we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. And there you go. That's it. The, nowadays, we just go sit in a seminar learning that communication and relationship is a mutual road. Paul has said it already. It's a mutual road. It's a two-way road. It's not a one-way road street. Pa Paul is a pastor. He is a missionary, but in this case, he is a pastor with pastor's heart. Some of the saints are very near and dear to Paul. Persica and Aquila, for example, who risked their lives for him. But there are others whom he knows and some that he does not. In our scripture passage that you read at the beginning of the worship, page 3, on Romans chapter 16, verses 3 through 15, there is a bunch of names, a lot of names. Some of those names are so difficult to understand, yet Paul is naming just as much as he remembers, he says those, those names. And then he goes to the many names that he doesn't know. There are people whom he doesn't know. He even prays for them and greets them. It's good 
to remember friends and talk to them. He, he is a good communicator. Now, there is a problem though here. The problem starts in the understanding of the fact that the, among the Greeks, they con you will see that in a few seconds, they considered the non-Greek people as barbarians. So Greek will be go to all those major philosophers and good thinkers, etc. of the history. They just consider themselves above all other people. So in the Greek understanding of 2,000 years ago, all non-Greek people were, in a way, fool, or at least not as wise as they are. They were barbarian, considered, and it has been clearly said in the Word of God that we read, they were considered barbarians. Now, in their eyes, some people were even worse than the regular, normal barbarians. For instance, the Jews. And among those Jews, imagine if someone was a very low-class Jew. What would be a low-class job among the Jews? How about a carpenter? A carpenter who is from a, just Israel, a nation that Rome conquered and destroyed them. And then there is a Jew who is a carpenter that was fully disgraced in a horrible shape. He was put in that cross. He was fully disgraced in their understanding. I mean, the, the execution of a bad person is a bad thing, right? The execution by crucifixion is a horrible thing. That carpenter, who was a Jew, was not a Greek, he was a Jew. A Jewish carpenter was crucified. And then there is a man who is follower of him. Oh boy. That's a lot of shame here, isn't it? It's not something to be proud or bold. Yet Paul is so proud of this. You know why? Because he loves these people. He loves them. He loves them. He loves them to the point that he wants to be with them constantly, but the Spirit doesn't allow him. Now, let's go to verses 16 and 17. Verses 16 and 17 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone, to everyone who believes, to the Jews first, and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. What a great testimony. In the eyes of the sophisticated people of the West of the time, that Jewish carpenter and his followers, the man who was disgraced, were not something to, be, to boast about, about his message. How similar is that to the culture of the time, 21st century Pacific Northwest, America? If you have never ever tried it, go ahead and give it a shot. Take a bunch of these Gospels and go to downtown Redmond, or go to Bellevue, or Seattle, or near South Lake Stevens, where all these tech companies are blooming. Okay, don't go that far. How about University of Washington? How about Western State University, Western Washington University? How about Edmonds Community College? How about Bothell Campus? How about your, ne your next door neighbor? Go ahead and tell them about a man who died so that you will not die. In the eyes of sophisticated people of 2,000 years ago, the world was contained two, two groups of people, the Greeks and the barbarians. You might be categorized the same way with different terminologies. You might be labeled in many ways. Paul welcomed being labeled as fool and a barbarian. 
he welcomed the idea of being full, considered foolish follower of a Jewish carpenter. I am. I am honored. I am humbled to walk around wherever he sends me and boldly say, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I know you are. Rome was a proud city. The gospel came from a humble city, Jerusalem. Among these low-class Jews, there were some people, some of them slaves, by the way, because of the persecution, they were sold to slavery at the time of Paul. I mean, by the time of James, a lot of Christians were slaves, sold into slavery, who were the followers of the way, capital W, basically the Christians. Christians were not the elites of the time. One of the churches somewhere in the world, I'm not going to tell you. As the pastor of the church welcomed me to the pulpit to be the guest preacher of that day, he said, our church is known for the, as the church of the elites. And then we're so honored that Mansour is our preacher. I said, well, I'm in the wrong church, it appears. It appears. They laughed, but they probably laughed at me. Christians were not the elites of the time. Yet Christians in such a circumstances as these are called to stand boldly and not be ashamed of the gospel. And that's what makes us brothers and sisters. When we are not ashamed of the gospel, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. To think of a little Jewish tent maker, Paul, going to Rome to preach the gospel is almost humorous to the people of the time. Are you kidding me, Paul? A tent baker coming to Rome? No. Now, he eventually went to Rome after writing this letter. Not just as a Jewish follower of a crucified carpenter and a tent maker, but as a prisoner himself. But then there you go. Next time you happen to be in Rome, do what I suggest you to do. I've been in Rome, I don't know, 10 times. The first time I got excited about Vatican and Vatican Museum and all the sculptures and museums and Da Vinci, etc. But that's it. Any time after that I made it to Rome, I quickly grab a taxi and I go outside the walls of the city. I don't stick to the excitements that are attractive to the tourists. I'm not driven by those things anymore. I go beyond the walls of the city to a poor, not well taken care of, monastery where the body of St. Paul is laid to rest. And I sit in that corner as a spiritual journey for myself and read Romans from chapter 1 to the end in one sitting. And that has a different meaning. I feel that Paul is preaching to me. I feel like just kind of, yeah, I'm a part of the church in Rome and he wants to talk to me. He wants to tell me something. What are you driven by? What do you want to be famous for? I encourage you and myself to be famous, not to be ashamed of the gospel. Amen? Amen. So today we are going to, as a part of our appreciation to the Lord Jesus Christ, we give our tithes and offerings, but we will have